for that warm invitation and it's lovely to see such a crowd here this evening and just the village. And the first thing I would like to say is thank you for your prayers. Uh, so many people were praying for me over the time uh, of the shooting incident and following that and God has certainly answered prayer otherwise I wouldn't be here this evening. So it's just wonderful to give him praise and honour and glory. And uh, so um, I want to read just a few verses of scripture uh, before I go on to talk more about the word. So I'm going to read a very familiar psalm that you all probably know off by heart. You don't even need to read it uh, or to look it up because you all know it by heart. But it's very precious and it's always been precious to me and it's still precious to me. Psalm 33, Shepherd's Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And I'm sure many of you can appreciate why I've read that psalm this evening. Uh, well, mainly because I have known the Lord as my shepherd, but I have proved him as my shepherd. And, and it's been evidence in my life that he's been my shepherd. And uh, David wrote this, and he really knew what he was talking about, as I'm sure we've all heard many sermons on this particular psalm. And we all know the history that David was a shepherd boy, so he knew exactly what he was talking about when he talked about a good shepherd. And uh, uh, how he was able to say, the Lord is my shepherd, not just any old shepherd or any old master, but the Lord is my shepherd. Uh, and so as a result of knowing Jesus or God as his shepherd, uh, he was able to say, I shall not want. Because he knew that the work of a shepherd, whenever he was a shepherd boy, his work was to look after the sheep and care for them, uh, protect them when the animal, wild animals came along, make sure they had good green pasture land to graze on, and whenever that was all eaten up, to move them on to other green, land, green pastures and to lead them beside the still waters, not a torrent or, a, or a, a mighty waterfall or somewhere like that where they couldn't really drink properly, but they had to drink from the quiet still waters. And so he maketh me to lie down in green pastures, he leadeth me beside the still waters. And it's so lovely to know that we're not, we don't have to find our own way in this path, in this life, uh, uh, in this world that we live in, but Jesus is leading us and guiding us uh, to those uh, pastures, those green pastures and the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He restoreth my soul. We all get weary and tired and maybe the green pastures are no longer any green, but he restoreth our souls. And then, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy Lord and thy staff, they comfort me. And I think I've had that, that, uh, that verse quoted in more prayers since I was shot than any other verse in scripture. Uh, particularly just after I'd been shot, the Africans used to come, some of the church leaders, and uh, even the missionaries, and they would pray with me, and very often they quoted that verse, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. It's so, so true, having gone through that valley and that difficult experience, that Jesus never leaves us or forsakes us. Sakes us. He's with us always. I will I fear no evil, no fear, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And again, I've proved that over and over again, that not only throughout this difficult experience of having been shot and uh, extremely ill at the time, and then getting over it, and then recuperating and 
and never dreaming of all the consequences, uh, the news media, the wonderful opportunities that the Lord has given to witness for him, to share with him, to share with the uh, various congregations and groups of peoples uh, just how God so wonderfully undertook and carried me through those difficult experiences. And then at the end of it all, not just carried me through them, brought me home, but also the opportunities to witness for him, to share the gospel, to glorify Jesus, and to tell others about him. You know, going back, going on through to the New Testament, we remember our Lord Jesus Christ when he was here on earth. One of the first things he did uh, when he started his ministry was to call disciples, to make disciples. And uh, we, we read uh, 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 in the earlier on in Matthew uh, how he called James and John and who, how they were fishermen and how they left their nets and their fisher boat, fishing boats and followed Jesus. And then Andrew and, uh, and, then, uh, and how they uh, immediately uh, left their nets and followed the Lord Jesus Christ. And then after that, then we uh, go further on and the Lord Jesus, whenever Peter uh, was, had been a disciple for the Lord Jesus for quite a period of time, and uh, then it came to uh, uh, the Lord Jesus coming up <coughs> towards Jerusalem and the Jesus said to them uh, that the, the Son of God, Man must suffer and die and rise again from the dead. And uh, Peter said, oh no, you can't. And he said that he was the, 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 the Lord who would die. Who would, um, I'm just reading it from um, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16. Um, then uh, Jesus then charged his disciples that they should tell no man uh, that he was uh, Jesus the Christ. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again from the third day. Then Peter, Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from you, Lord, uh, this, shall not be, uh, this shall not be unto you. But he turned and said unto him, Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offence unto me, for thou savourest not the things that be of God but those that be of men. And then we come to that lovely verse in 24, and he says, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Now this was the story of Jesus. He was face set to go to Jerusalem, and he warned the disciples, You know, I'm going there, I'm going to die, but I'm going to rise again. And then Peter said, No way, Lord, you can't die. There's no way you're going to die. And, and that's, then Jesus rebuked them. And then Jesus challenged these people. And after calling them into his ministry, then he challenged them. Then he said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. And whosoever shall lose his life for my sake uh, shall find it. For what shall be pro man profit if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for a soul? And so we have this Lord Jesus telling, challenging the people to follow him, to walk in his footsteps. And you know, he's saying, if any man will come out, let him deny himself. What do we do when we deny ourselves? We deny ourselves the, what the world has to offer. We're denying ourselves, uh, even um, uh, saving ourselves. And uh, we're denying what uh, our selfish desires would be. But to follow Jesus, if any man would uh, uh, come up left in the night, so take up his cross. Uh, it wouldn't be, because taking up a cross, remember this is before the Lord Jesus died that he said, challenging them to take up their cross. And the Lord Jesus had already told them that he was going to, going to die on the cross and rise again. And he says, if you want to follow me, you've got to be willing to do that as well. To willing, you know, although Peter had already uh, challenged Jesus and tried to say to Jesus that he, uh, he wouldn't uh, die, uh, he wouldn't have to die. And I suppose Peter was thinking of all the wonderful miracles that the Lord did, and remembering again even how he raised Lazarus from the dead. And he was thinking, Jesus wouldn't die. But I don't know what Peter thought Jesus had come into the world to do. He realized he had come in to save sinners. And he had realized he was Christ, the Son of God. Uh, uh, and so we have this challenge to take up our cross, to be willing to suffer for the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, uh, even go all the way to death if necessary. 
And then uh, we come to the very end of the last book, or book of Matthew, the last chapter of Matthew, when uh, he, Jesus, after the resurrection and before he ascended into heaven, he said, what did he say? All authority in heaven and earth have been given unto me, therefore go. But he's, uh, and, and preach the gospel to all nations. Uh, so he wasn't willing to send out the disciples uh, without equipping them. Uh, so he said, uh, therefore, uh, all authority, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given, given unto me. Therefore go into all the world and preach the gospel. Uh, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I with all that power and all that authority am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So it's wonderful, the Lord Jesus, indeed he has called us, he has to, to, to follow him, he has challenged us to take up our cross, to count the cost, to be willing to go all the way to the cross, should we? but he's also promised to be with us always. He's never promised never to leave us or forsake us. How many times do we read those verses in the Bible? That Jesus, when he, he said, and Peter and uh, the other uh, disciples reminded our uh, uh, writers of the letters, reminded uh, the uh, Christians uh, of their day, Jesus said that I will never leave thee nor forsake We read that in Hebrews, of course, 13 and 10 and, and 8. I will never, never, ever leave you or forsake you. And that's wonderful that Jesus with all that power and all that authority, why should we fear if Jesus with all that power and authority is going with us all the way? And uh, uh, so, uh, as many of you know, I uh, have been teaching this and applying it to myself each time I go out. Uh, but I uh, must say, whenever it happens, you think it's, it's quite a surprise whenever something dramatic does happen. Uh, but, uh, you know, when I came home and thought again about the shooting incident, and I read these verses in First Peter, uh, letter, uh, Peter's letter, the first uh, of his letters, in chapter 4, verse 12, it says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. And Paul says similar things in his letters. But um, it, what a thrill. Uh, we shouldn't be surprised. We shouldn't be, because the Lord has promised, he said, uh, uh, you know, whenever he's given us that challenge to go and preach the gospel, when he's challenging us to go out to take up our cross and follow him. So we shouldn't be surprised at the fiery trial, which is to try as though something strange were happening. But rejoice in as much as you're partakers of Christ's suffering. And you know, when I thought about it, I thought, well, how wonder, what an honor that the Lord Jesus could trust and trust me to go through that suffering for his name's sake and, uh, and to, uh, uh, to partic participate with him in that and uh, to identify with him in that. Now, uh, as many of you know, I think most people here have probably heard me in the past. Anybody here tonight who hasn't heard me in the past? Uh, oh, there are a few. <laughs> well, I'll share a very, very uh, brief uh, testimony of just how the Lord led me to himself. Uh, I was brought up to go to church in Sunday school as a child in Cookstown, but it was only when I went to do nursing training and through the influence of Nurses Christian Fellowship and Christian nurses in the Royal that I came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. And it happened because I had preconceived ideas about becoming a Christian. I used to think just people got emotionally worked up at meetings and things like that. And there wasn't anything, any real experience of coming to know God. But you know, as I went, as I fellowship with these other nurses and went to the Nurses Christian Fellowship, I realized they'd got something in their lives that I didn't have. And I began to seek and to search. Uh, and uh, it, very simply how God led me to himself. I heard the need and I knew that I had to ask the Lord Jesus into my heart and into my life. I knew I had to confess my sin before him. I knew I had to ask him for forgiveness of my sins and to come into my heart. Uh, but nothing had happened. And then one evening, very simply, I was out visiting an uncle, a retired Presbyterian minister, and he was leading me out to the bus stop. We were discussing something about uh, an ecumenical movement. My uncle was talking about it, whatever it was, he didn't approve of it. And uh, 
then he turned to me and he was talking about, you know, the most important thing is, is Jesus is living and reigning in your heart. And he challenged me about that just as the bus was coming up to take me into the nurse's training, nurse's home that night. And I remember just as clearly as anything getting on the bus and asking the Lord Jesus Christ into my heart just then. Because it was then the Holy Spirit suddenly I could hear rapping in my heart's door. And uh, as I got on the bus and on the, on the way into uh, Belfast from Dunmurray where I had been uh, that weekend, uh, I just remember clearly just as sure as uh, the reality that Jesus was alive and that he'd come into my heart and my life had changed. And so I went down, got down my knees, when I got into my bedroom and just thanked him for coming into my heart. And I knew since after that my life was changed, the Bible became alive to me. I really wanted to feed on his word after that. And uh, just uh, my goal after that was to believe, uh, to follow in Jesus' footsteps, to be obedient to him. And not to do my will, but his will. So I went over to Edinburgh to do ministry, and was why I was doing ministry, that God clearly called me into full-time work. And some of you have heard the story how halfway through my training, I decided to fast and pray, didn't have dinner this particular day, went up to my bedroom, closed the door, got out my Bible, and my scripture union notes, which I was following at that time, and the reading that particular day was Revelations chapter 3, and God suddenly spoke to me through, through verse 8. Behold, I have laid before you an open door that no man can shut, that is the little strength and kept my word, and not denied my name. And I thought, well, God's calling me here. And then I began to think, maybe I'm just reading into these verses. So I said to God, if you're really calling me, because I really didn't feel I had the qualification to be a missionary or do any full-time work. Uh, so I prayed, Lord, if it's your will that I should go into full-time work, I pray that within 24 hours I hear some, I get some information about a Bible college. And sure enough, the next morning in the post, in the pigeonholes, there was an envelope for me in the K pigeonhole. And whenever I opened it up, it wasn't a syllabus about Bible college in Glasgow. So I really couldn't doubt anymore because God confirmed, he gave me the word, he gave me the seal, and I couldn't doubt anymore, anymore that, he, wasn't, that he, he was calling me to missionary work. Now I still felt very inadequate, even though I, he called me, I still felt rush, I couldn't do that, but I, I very, very inadequate. Uh, but I continued to finish my military training and there was a vacancy for me in the WAC Missionary Training College in Glasgow. Uh, uh, and so I continued to um, uh, go there and again uh, the Lord because I felt very inadequate uh, the Lord gave me lovely promises that have been that were an encouragement to me then and still are today and from 1st Corinthians chapter 1 and you've heard me reading these uh, verses before but just bear with me as I read them again 1st uh, Corinthians chapter 1 verse 26 to the end for you see your calling brethren how that not many wise men after the flesh not many mighty not many noble are called but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto his wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. And that's why I'm here this evening, to glory in our Lord Jesus Christ, what he has done for me, what he's doing for the church out in Congo, what he's still doing in our church today. So you know, glory, you know, anything that I share with you tonight is to give glory and honor to Jesus. And so it's been a tremendous uh, thrill and, pr and privilege just to follow the Lord Jesus out to the Congo. I finished my mid uh, Bible school training, went to London, did the candidates course, went over to Bel Belgium, had to do a tropical diseases course in French before finally I sailed to the Congo. Yes, sailed. In those days we used to sail to the mission field. And that was way back in 1968. And it sailed around the west coast of Africa, right around to the port of Matali, and then up to the capital of Kinshasa. Did the stage for six weeks to get a little certificate to say I could practice medical work in the Congo. And then flew up to the northeast, uh, this area here, which is the area that we work in. Now, Congo is one of the largest, uh, the second largest country in Africa. 
uh, surrounded by nine other African countries. Uh, but now, uh, every time I go in and out, I go in via East Africa. I came in the first time West Africa, but now I go in via East Africa. I used to come into Kenya and then uh, charter a map a, a flight into Congo. But now I fly into Uganda, in Tebe, and then charter a map plane. And as usual, uh, I would order up medical supplies uh, from a Kampala medical store and then charter a small map plane uh, to take them into the Congo. And so uh, over the years, of course, when I got into the Congo in 1968, I learned another language, Swahili. And then uh, over the years, I've worked at various mission stations, ending up at this little place called Molita in 1986. And uh, since that, uh, have been uh, building up the mission station. When I first went there, there was a little church, there was a leprosy camp, there was a Bible school, and a little outpatient apartment. But the church uh, ha had a great burden. They wanted me to start a nurses' training school, or at least a midwifery uh, training midwife, and build a little hospital because a lot of women were dying of ch in childbirth and other diseases, uh, strangulated hernias, children with malaria, and so they wanted a health uh, little hospital there at Molita. And uh, they they said they'd built it. And would I do the training? Well, they built it. And it was just mud huts where you tried to wash a mud floor or mud walls or stop the rats running through grass and leaf roofs, impossible. Uh, so uh, I got the church leaders together and told them we needed bricks. So they said they knew there were two little brick machines somewhere that the Belgians had left. So they hunted in the forest and they found them. And they got them out and got them cleaned up and we started making bricks. And we used the uh, old ant hills. There were lots of big, big ant hills. And the uh, soil in the ant hills was the best soil for making bricks because the saliva of the termites or the flying ants in the uh, ant hills helps to cling the soil together in the making of the bricks. Uh, so we started making bricks and we used to get ladies coming to our antenatal clinic to bring either one big stone or two smaller ones. And an architect in our church at home drew up a little plan which duly impressed the authorities and we started our little building project. We were right, right in the rainforest, so lots of uh, trees to cut up, saw into planks, and so we started our building project. And we got our maternity built, we got our operating theatre, our surgical ward, uh, we got our extended our outpatients, uh, we got a little house built, a little, uh, for our dwelling house as well. And we had bricks made for um, a medical ward whenever war broke out. And of course, the politics of Africa and Congo all over the, the wars and rumours of war. Congo got her independence in 1960 from Belgium. And then there was that terrible rebellion in 64. And I'm sure many of you saw Bob McAllister on the television a couple of weeks ago. And he was uh, out during the 1964 rebellion when a lot of missionaries were, a number of missionaries were martyred. Uh, and so after that rebellion, then uh, eventually when missionaries went back, there was a man called Mobutu came into power. Now, he was in power for 33 years and practically destroyed the whole infrastructure of the country. Uh, so after, uh, after he uh, left, or he was put out in 1996, all the roads were destroyed, the plantations all reverted back to forests, and, uh, and there was no postal service and no banks and no nothing. So the country just went from bad to worse. And eventually then war, of course, broke out and we were evacuated, came back and evacuated again. And eventually, 1998 was the time we were evacuated using the white coat. And some of you remember the story of the white coat. Because of that, couldn't get back in. So then I went to work in southern Sudan for a few years. That was like going out of the frying pan into the fire. But eventually got back into the Congo again and uh, worked at Nebobongo a couple of years. Eventually, war ended in the, at Molita down in our mission station in 2004, but uh, it was completely destroyed. A lot of the buildings were burned to the ground. Uh, the Land Rover was stolen, a lot of things. But uh, praise the Lord, he opened up the way to go back to 2004, and we started rebuilding the buildings again. Got our medical ward built, and we got um, a doctor's and an administrator's house built, and an administration block. And then we got the hospital completely fin finished. Then we decided, because there were a lot of children around, none of them were educated, and they needed schooling. So we built a little primary school, seven classroom primary school, and a little office block. And then last year, we decided we'd build a little nursery because the children, uh, the little uh, siblings of the children who went to the primary school, 
all wanted to go to the primary school when you couldn't teach these wee two-year-olds. So we decided that we'd build a little nursery and we just started building that whenever I was shot. Uh, so uh, I wanted to give you that background before I start showing you the pictures. So um, and, uh, I think I just want to put that here. This, this was moving forward. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. <coughs> it should be there. <laughs> uh, I'm taking one or two pictures from long ago. Okay, there we are. And uh, this is, as I say, I uh, come in, I want to charter an airplane from. Uganda, Entebbe, and to uh, Molita. And this is our mission station, Molita. There's the airstrip. And um, because the roads are so bad now, we have airstrips. And my house is just here. And uh, the, this is the church. Bible school is off the picture on the left hand side. And uh, uh, this is the hospital compound here. That's the maternity there. That's the outpatients. That's the new, new medical, pediatric ward, surgical ward. Administration block operating theatre and my house is there. So the night of the uh, shooting, I was called from my house to the maternity and then back again. Um, this is I uh, administrate. This is the school, the primary school we built there. That's the old leprosy camp up there. And uh, 19 and uh, 2013 was the anniversary, the centenary <coughs> anniversary of our. Um, uh, mission and CT stub came out in 1913. So we decided we did several things to celebrate that. And one was re roofing the church, which was built by missionaries before me, but they had roofed it with old tin from Belgian houses that got rustier and rustier every time there was a storm, another bit went off. So we did that as part of the centenary celebration in 2013. And you can see what a difference the roof made. And then this was the last building we built in the hospital complex. That's one of the uh, doctors. And uh, okay. And then the uh, school which we built and got open, just opened it for 1913 or 2013 as well. Uh, seven classrooms, although there are six grades, but seven classrooms and an office block over here. And uh, I was very embarrassed, and I think I've seen you've seen this before. Uh, they called the school after me. A, a call, premier, more tales. Tried to get them to change the name, but they wouldn't do it. <laughs> and they stand by. And these are some of the. We would have about 400 students in the, uh, primary school students in the in the um, in the primary school. And of course, all these uniforms have to be made with hand sewing machines. No electricity there every single one of them, so, uh, but it gave some employment. And this is where I would order the medical supplies from JMS, Joint Medical Stores, uh, by email and then collect them. And you can see why I needed the whole thing because of all the supplies and others uh, from JMS and uh, what I had also sent out from home, including the barrel to catch rainwater. My, uh, um, Pharmacist was delighted to see it, see me and the, the stuff because he uh, had completely run out of medicines when I arrived, so he was very delighted to see them. And then our running water is a bit different from the running water here. <laughs> uh, I usually catch the rainwater on the four, one, a bar in each of the four corners of my house, but they, it had it, uh, it, it run dry, they'd reused it all up. So the children from the school, they go about half a mile uh, to the nearest water hole and go down and bring it up. And how they can balance this water on their heads, it takes, I have to get them both from it. Because it's quite a steep climb on my hands and knees usually. They're very amazing. That's our hands-on pastor. Uh, he's a good pastor, but he likes to do practical things as well. So he's finishing off uh, the inside of a brass roof. And here we are, demolishing an old amp till. Uh, this is actually the Bible School compound, and there's the two little brick machines that we did all our building with, the school, the hospital, the church, and uh, Bible School, and now the nursery. And uh, so they're making them, and then we dry them, and of course lots of wood in the, in the forest for firewood, as well as for building the modern houses. And we'd, after drying the bricks, we build them into a kiln, and then put in the firewood to burn the bricks, and uh, uh, we know they're burned whenever there's only hot air coming out the top. So it usually takes two or three days. 
and then we were laying uh, out the foundation for the uh, nursery. We had to send the people down to the river about a mile and a half away uh, to get the stones because our, our ground is very sandy soil and uh, there wouldn't be any rocks or stones. And uh, so we got our burned bricks all ready and started, got the, the uh, foundations in and started building. And then um, this is a plaque uh, which was given to me by a family in my congregation and my church at home. The Hill family whose father had died, they've been supporting me over the years and they gave the donations in lieu of flowers for me. So they had this little plaque made, so I got it made into a bigger plaque uh, by our head carpenter and his assistant. And uh, this was, picture was taken just a couple of days before I was shot. I just want to tell you about the head carpenter. Whenever the bandits were coming in that day, it was a Sunday, it was a Sunday night, I was shot. Um, one of them claimed to be a very far out relation of this man's wife. So they stopped at his house and they were having a meal at the time. So they invited us, as you do in Congo, uh, to eat with them. So they had a meal with them. And then they went off. Now, Nelson, this carpenter, had absolutely no idea they were bandits or what their plans were. And uh, so he, he went to bed as usual. But in the middle of the night after the shooting incident, and the chief or the pastor had sent people out to look for these bandits, suddenly the word got out that they'd been seen at Nelson's house and he was going to be arrested. So he, he fled into the forest with his wife and family. Now his younger brother didn't go, but he was he was arrested then. And uh, this man Nelson is still hiding in the forest, although he's completely innocent. There's no reason why he should, shouldn't come out. Now he did try to come out at one time, but he was they threatened to arrest him. So he went, he ran back into the forest and still prayed. So I just asked for prayer for Nelson. He's a godly man. He was uh, my head carpenter. He was very faithful. He kept the tools. He kept the nails. He kept everything and and the wood, and he kept a check on everything. He was, all, he was a deacon in the church, a very a very good man, and I just feel bad that he's uh, still hiding in the forest. Uh, this uh, fella here, his father was also a, 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 a hard-working man who worked closely with me, and that's him, he and I were going to see the governor that particular day. That's why he's all dressed up. But the previous week to my shooting, he was in Punya, our local town 30 miles away buying things for the hospital, etc. And while he was there, he was talking to these bandits. Again, had no idea they were bandits, but because of the association, because people had seen him talking to them, they uh, jumped to the wrong conclusions that he had something to do with the, uh, uh, with the shooting incident. So uh, he was immediately arrested and uh, taken down to the big prison in Kindu, which is the main Manyema area, and he's still in prison. Now, we've worked very hard trying to get him out, but he's still in prison, of course, they're still looking for big money for him. Uh, we were uh, going along this little side road, the bamboo was blowing over the, the road, and the chief had told the people to cut the bamboo down. They cut it down, but didn't clear the road, so we had to make a way round behind to get through there. And then we came out to the main road. And this is a main road in Congo. And uh, you can see what happens whenever it rains and how slippery and uh, terrible it is to uh, get through here. And uh, uh, that vehicle got through and then another one came and you see the other one was stuck and it gets stuck there as well. And so they're digging and digging and digging, trying to get out one here, one here, and one here. Uh, and of course they're always overloaded, these vehicles. Uh, but eventually they got out. And then we come to a lovely smooth road because for the first time in all the years I've been in Congo, there's a German company called AAA and they're doing a tremendous work on the roads. They've got lots of machinery. I think it's Germany's way of giving aid to Africa. And they really are doing a good job. This is, for instance, that used to be a very bad bridge. It had logs on it. When I had the Land Rover before it was stolen, I used to get stuck there. We used to have to dig, uh, cut down trees and branches and uh, logs and fill in the, 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 the uh, between the logs. And some of you remember this uh, bridge from last year. And that's uh, there was only the one log you could walk on. That's on that little second class road to the ferry crossing. And uh, uh, I was standing here with my bicycle. This fella comes along, lifts my bicycle, and off he went across it. 
uh, well, eventually it didn't get across it. But this look at it now, you wouldn't realize that was the same bridge. Again, I'd asked the German company to, to uh, repair this bridge. They said, oh, it's not on the main road, we can't do it. But um, uh, eventually they did, they did do it uh, because um, last year uh, uh, some Christians at home for money more uh, did a sponsored walk to raise money for the repair of this particular bridge. But also there was sand on the other side of it and, and the Germans who were using that uh, for the roads. They put in a big, big, big metal pipe to drain off the water and then put in rocks and stones and sand, etc. And then this is our local shop. This is our supermarket. <coughs> and they sell their flip flops and their locks and creams and whatnot. And they go through the villages uh, selling their wares. We don't have any proper shops. This uh, lady was in the back of a motorbike on this newly repaired road, which was going far too fast round the corner. The, the uh, back tire, front tire burst, and off the woman went, very seriously injured, was carried into us unconscious. Her pupils were unequal and not reacting to light. She had every sign of brain hemorrhage. And so we prayed, we spent all night in prayer, praying for her. And then miraculously, she began to waken up the next morning. And we were able to ask her, was she a Christian? She said, as a child, she gave her life to Jesus, but she'd never gone on. And she hadn't been to church for years. Uh, so she said she wanted to get right with God, because she realized God had saved her life. And there she was, by, uh, on the way to recovery. So we praise God for that, that he saved her life spiritually as well as uh, physically. And uh, then uh, we used to have to cross uh, this river in canoes since the old uh, ferry was destroyed in 1997 in the war. And then thereafter we had to cross this big river in canoes, forgetting all about the crocodiles, etc. in the river. But now the German, that same German company on this lovely new uh, um, Area, which is tremendous and tre tremendous help. And the reason we were there, we heard that the, the uh, governor was coming and everybody was supposed to go down to greet the governor and cheer him on. So when he saw me amongst the crowd, he called me over. So it was great to have uh, an opportunity to see him. And I didn't realize uh, how beneficial it would be. He said, now if I can ever help you, let me know and encourage me in the work. Uh, these people were uh, all about him, including this guy here who couldn't stand because he had polio as a child and was paralyzed. But he was as happy as the rest and jumping and, pray, and uh, praising God. Uh, there we have uh, the uh, governor uh, giving his uh, talk and encouraging the people to work hard in their fields and uh, 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 to support the government. And then he left and all his entourage of soldiers and whatnot. And then it was uh, Children's Christmas Day service and children responding <coughs> to the gospel and taking part in the Children's Christmas Day service. And then Christmas Day came and that morning I went down, uh, when I was doing the ward round to uh, distribute some uh, clothes to the babies. This lady here, I've been up half the night trying to bring her little baby into the world. It was her, her first baby. And as usual, as soon as I go to help a lady deliver, I asked, was she a Christ Christian before I started praying with her? And she said, no, she wasn't. We prayed for her and for the baby, and that she would have a safe delivery and a live baby. And uh, during the time we were waiting for this baby to arrive and working on her, uh, we continued to explain the gospel to her. And eventually we got a live, healthy baby and we put her back in her bed, and as we were putting her back, I said, no, we have to thank God for how he answered prayer. And she said, well, before you do that, I want to ask Jesus into my heart. So that was a lovely Christmas Day present. Not only did she get a live, healthy baby, but she, got the, and she came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as her Savior as well. Yeah. So that was a great Christmas Day that she'll never forget. And then uh, there was this lady here, she was, she was a Christian and she had twins about two, three weeks before this. Again, we had great difficulty getting the second one into the world, it was delayed, we got it delivered by breach. And then the baby wouldn't breathe for about 20 minutes, artificial respiration. But the baby made a remarkable recovery and had no signs of brain damage or anything like that. And did very, they were only just over a kilo in weight at birth, we have no incubators, no oxygen. But, you know, God's hand was upon them, and she believed that God would look after them, and he did. And when I left, they were about a kilo and a half in weight, but I think uh, then afterwards I didn't hear they continued until they were two kilos and they were allowed home then. 
New Year's Day is a day when we all eat together. Whatever food you have in the house, you bring it and everybody uh, fellowships together over the same meal. And we just usually have a time of praising the Lord and rejoicing. And then I, I, I went down to the maternity, lots of baby clothes still left from Christmas Day. So I went down to distribute these baby clothes uh, to the mothers and babies. And, uh, and uh, our, our nurses were not in uniform because it was a holiday. So the same lady, the twins lady, she got a double set of clothing. The other ladies had left and another set were in. Now these are three midwives. This, this lady here, her husband is a man who's in prison and put in uh, uh, Hindu, Mama Maria. And this is Mama Rebecca, the second one. She's a nurse a midwife who called me the night I was shot. And then Jean. Jean, he just came back to work with us in December. He started off as an auxiliary nurse, became an ordinary registered nurse, and then became a, a university trained nurse. And I was just beginning to train him up to take over my job. Now, uh, he came with me to get these baby clothes and some of these old ladies' clothes. So he wore them just to give the ladies a good laugh. So we had a really, we had a, he's really funny and very uh, comic and uh, uh, we really had a very uh, happy occasion distributing these gifts to the mothers in the maternity. Now little did I know that I would be the next patient, I'd be very soon a patient a few days later. It was the 4th of January and uh, uh, I think many of you know what happened in the middle of the night. I was called, Mama Rebecca called, she came and wrapped my shutters off my bedroom window, told me that there was a lady uh, had been brought in. She had had previous cesarean sections and needed another cesarean section as she was in strong labour. Uh, now, I talked to her about it, dealt with it, and uh, there was a, we have two nurse surgeons who were uh, capable of doing the cesarean section. Uh, so I, I, then uh, I said, well, do you really need me down there? And she said, no, uh, but we wanted to let you know what was happening. I said, okay, if there are no other problems, you go, go ahead, do the cesarean section, any problems at all, come back and call me. So off she went, and then about 15 minutes later, as I was settling down to sleep again, there was another map on the same shutters of the same bedroom window. And uh, this time it was a man uh, calling me. He said I was urgently needed in the maternity. And uh, 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 but I reassured him everything was under control there. He was very, very insistent that I go. And uh, because he was so insistent, I thought he was a, an over anxious hus uh, husband of the patient. Uh, but in fact, it was the bandits luring me out. But I had no idea about that at the time. So I went to the back door, and my night guard was there. He had heard me talking to somebody. So he uh, said, Have you to go to the hospital, madam? Said. I said, Yes. He said, Well, then I'm coming with you. So we locked the back door and off we went to the hospital. And we got to the hospital, we asked, uh, we, we met some of the relatives and staff between the upper maternity and the operating theater. And so I said, what's the problem? What's the emergency? And uh, no reply, and I had to ask about three times before they said, no, we didn't call you. We don't know what the emergency is. There is no emergency. So I asked some others, no emergency. We didn't know where's the husband. We didn't know. Think they thought he was in the operating theater. So um, we, we decided, I said to my night guard, if there's no problem, we just go back to the house. Now, I still didn't, didn't even dawn on me that this could be a hoax, a setup. Uh, so we went back to the house, and we would just gone in through the compound gate, and we are going up the side of the house, uh, because I had come out through the back door, and just as we went in, up the side of the house, suddenly these two bandits came running around from the back of the house, both uh, wearing camouflage clothing and masks, and one with a gun pointed at me just like that. The other bandit grabbed my night guard and went off with him. Now this gun was all wrapped up in weeds and things, and I thought it was just a bit of a stick. I didn't think it was a real gun. But I, so I went to grab at it, and I thought, he's not going to overcome me. I, he's not going to fight me. So I went to grab at it. And as I grabbed at the, at, at the gun, of course, he pulled the trigger. And then I knew it was a real gun. And uh, it was a terrific bang. And it was a very sharp pain because it came, it went through here and came out my back. And uh, various medical staff, when they were doing my dressings afterwards, were amazed because there was a large blood vessel there. How it didn't puncture that blood vessel, and that was just a miracle from the Lord. And where it came out of the back, it fractured two vertebrae and two ribs. So obviously, it was very, very, very close to my spinal cord. And if it severed the side of the cord, I would have been uh, paralyzed. So God's hand was even on the bullet. 
that had just went right through there and uh, lower fractured uh, the vertebrae in the ribs. Uh, uh, really, I just praised God because I was able to continue standing. And uh, after, uh, he, uh, whenever he shot me, I yelled at the top of my voice. And the uh, finger frightened him, he ran off. Then. <laughs> <laughs> and then, I, then I kept on shouting for the pastor and various people, but nobody came, so I just put my back uh, firmly against the wall um, to try to stop the bleeding and press firmly. He kept on yelling and shouting and shouting <coughs> quite a long time. And eventually, eventually, I'm sure it was seven, ten minutes, uh, my night guard eventually got free from the bandits that were holding him. And he got back to me and he said, because I was still shouting for the pastor and various others, he said, I'm going to call the pastor and the chef the boss. So off he ran off and everybody else was too terrified to come near me because they heard the shooting and they heard uh, me yelling. So they thought there were bandits were still around and they would have got shot. But the wee night guard, he was so courageous, he came, he wasn't frightened, and he went on and called them. Very soon, they beat the drum, and everybody suddenly appeared out of their houses and came. And uh, then, as the pastor and uh, they were helping me into the house, I was just very, very conscious of God's presence. And God was saying to me, I'm in control here. And it was just reassuring to know that God was in control, and just to know his peace. Now, I didn't feel any anger, I didn't feel any bitterness, uh, I didn't feel any, even any fear. I just felt God's peace and knowing the knowledge that God was in control. So I got into the house, but as soon as I got into the house, it just collapsed on the floor. And uh, then they tried to put up another IV, and uh, just on the mat on the floor, and that's where the bullet came out. Now, this is the wall that I was pressing, kept us, I didn't want to all of them bloody in case someone feels a bit sick looking at blood. But this is where my I was standing against the wall. You can see the imprint of my back and how the blood had saturated into the bricks. And uh, 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 then uh, this is the pastor who eventually came and the various people trying to put up uh, an IV, of course, had lost, by that time had lost a lot of blood and hence the reason I collapsed on the floor. Now this is my little night guard. Uh, who was so courageous, and uh, uh, the, the tragic thing is, about a month after this, uh, he was fined $150, don't ask me why, corruption of Africa. So, because uh, I'd left some money, so they took that out of the, my money. And then another month later, he was arrested and thrown into the local prison about 30 miles from us. And uh, I then contacted the governor, contacted the head of the military, and eventually they let him out of prison. But then, again, about a month ago, I heard that he was in prison again, into the big prison. And their excuse was they wanted to hear his, his uh, testimony, although that night we did share uh, exactly what happened. Uh, they wanted him to witness or give a witness uh, uh, as to what had happened. And so he was thrown into prison. And I contacted the governor again and various people, but he's still in prison. They say he knew, they know he's innocent, but they're now some of the... Uh, corrupt officials, they're wanting him to pay a large sum of money to get him out of prison. Uh, so this innocent man who say, who without him probably I would eventually have died because nobody else wanted to come near me, and there he is suffering in prison. And I heard last weekend he was very, very ill because they don't get fed in prison and they depend on other people giving them food and he probably had the